Just read the Palm Sunday story um, for you from Luke, Luke 19, 28. Now, Jesus said this and then went on to Jerusalem ahead of them. As he came near Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you. As you go in, you will find a colt tied up that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If someone asks you why are you untying it, tell him that the master needs it. They went on their way and found everything just as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying it? The master needs it, they answered, and they took the colt to Jesus. Then they threw their cloaks over the animal and helped Jesus get on. And as he rode on, people spread their cloaks on the road. When they came to Jerusalem, at the place where the road went down the Mount of Olives, the large crowd of his disciples began to thank God and praise him in loud voices for all the great things that they had seen. God bless the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. Then some of the Pharisees in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, command your disciples to be quiet. Jesus answered, I tell you that if they keep quiet, <coughs> the stones themselves will start shouting. He came closer to the city and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, If you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. The time will come when your enemies will surround you with barricades, blockade you, and close you in from every side. They will completely destroy you and the people within your walls. Not a single stone will they leave in its place, because you did not recognize the time when God came to save you. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out the, the merchants, saying to them, <clears throat> It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a hideout for thieves. And that tremendous passage with which you are very familiar and I'm familiar. It will be good to look at it in detail it will be good to say as i have said in hundreds of sermons what can we make of what jesus says the hiring of the donkey the the shouting of what hosanna means the the uh the way that jesus deals with the temple there's a huge amount of detail in this vivid story and we would do well to look at it but this week for me i have looked at this story and i have felt a great sort of tension in my mind. On the one hand, we have this story of colour and light and noise and joy, all that Middle Eastern sort of um, frisson that you can still see sometimes in festivals and what have you, in crises and all sorts of things in the Middle East. Many people shouting, dust, waving their arms about, people getting very excited. We have here the, the waving of the palm leaves and the donkey and the the, the, the crush and all of that stuff, which is such a great picture, to which we bring such a lot of um, thought and understanding, kingship, messiahship, the beginning of Easter, Jesus comes to save us, and so on and so on. But I've also been thinking of what's at the, the centre of people's minds this week. What is it that has dominated our worldview? And I want to set that alongside this plane crash in the Alps. Because I was challenged by this because they seem to be completely different stories. <laughs> the modern technology, the disaster, the crash, the inquiry, the helicopters and all this stuff. The bereaved, the sad, the names, the pictures, the students in Germany with the bells tolling and lighting candles. The speculation of what was going on inside that young man's mind. 
And over here I've got all that colour and noise and hosannas. And on this side, I've got something very different. And without being too clever, I just think that we need to struggle with how those two things work. Because we live in a world which is not full of people in sandals waving palm leaves around. And in this week, we do not do well simply to lift ourselves from one world into another. But again, without being too clever, as we would expect, this word from this uh, Palm Sunday story speaks exactly what we need to hear on such a week as this. After all, Jerusalem in its very specific sense 2,000 years ago will stand for everything that's difficult in the world at the moment. There's not a problem with that. It was a place of power, it was a place of politics, it was a place of trade and of money and of graft. It was, a, it, was a, it was a place of great injustice. It was a place where um, there was a, a regime which, you know, of the Romans and all their toadies, where, where, where it was totally authoritarian, where there were no human rights, um, where there was very little health care. It was a place where the very rich lived next to the extremely poor, huge poverty, huge riches huge exploitation and abuse and all sorts of injustice. It was a place where peoples of all sorts came together and didn't get on. Above all, it was the biggest place around, so it was the center of everything that went on. It was definitely the heart of things and it was the heart of the problem. And in the middle of it, it was a great big temple and a religion that everybody kind of believed in, but they weren't quite sure how much they did believe in it. It stands very well for where we are today. In its sufferings and its pain and its despair and its hypocrisy, it could stand for our world today. Not just in the disasters of a modern plane crash and the way that people are broken in so many ways. But all those people that we think about each week and this week are in the refugee camps of the Middle East or in broken homes and destroyed in the dust and the dirt of some Middle Eastern country and there are more and more of them or in a freezing cold wet cellar in the Ukraine but also in the darkness and hopelessness of this new political sphere that we have at the moment coming up to the general election well finally the politicians come out and tell us clearly that they they really want the job and we are going to be useful for the next few weeks until they've got it <laughs> and that's the end of it for another five years this is not good news nobody voted for Herod perhaps it's the darkness of the less drama of our own community where we might have seen from the from the news, from the Cornishman, that we may spend millions on a new superstore for our pets, where you could buy everything for your pampered poop. And yet our food banks and our breakfast project are overflowing. We have money for animals, but we do not have money for people. Across that whole range of things, Jerusalem would stand. And the message of this passage is, above all, that God comes and God intervenes. That we have the God who comes, and he comes directly into the heart of the matter. He goes straight into Jerusalem, as Graham Greene would say, into the heart of the matter, as Conrad would say, into the heart of darkness. And he makes straight for it. This is a huge story. We Christians get blasé about the God who intervenes because we do Christmas and we do Easter. We know God intervenes, but he might not. We need to brush off the idea that this is an enormous thing that he does, that he might not. After all, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, there is, as God, nothing in it for him. He doesn't need this. He could stand off. 
He could remain in heaven. He could remain in perfection. He doesn't need this. They need it, but he doesn't need it. But he does intervene. We live in a world where intervention is not really popular. We know that if somebody collapses in the street, hundreds of people will step over them and walk around them until somebody finally decides that they will ring 999 on their mobile phone. We know that. We know that people can be mugged and broken into, and whatever, nobody wants to intervene. In fact, you get told not to intervene. And our nation, it only intervenes because of its own interests, its own power struggle, its own need for oil, or whatever it is. It never intervenes for somebody else's good. Intervention is not popular. You don't want to get involved. You don't know where it'll land. You've got to have an exit strategy. <laughs> I know what would have happened on the first Palm Sunday if Jesus needed an exit strategy. And yet God comes and intervenes. And that is quite extraordinary. Just because you know it every year doesn't make it not extraordinary. He might not have done that. It tells us in this passage why he intervenes, why he comes to the heart of the matter, whether it's in your life or it's in our world tells us that when he gets near to Jerusalem, Jesus wept. It's almost as though God gives us a big steer here, a big lead. He looks and he says, somebody ought to weep. And he does. It says here that he sees it as it is. He sees how bad it is. Everybody else is in denial or they're whinging or they're blaming somebody else or, or what have you. But Jesus, it says there, sees how awful it is. Oh, Jerusalem. And he weeps. Not in a sort of wet sort of weeping, but the weeping that is honest. Very grown up. Not only is it terrible, but he sees it's going to get worse. If only you could see, it'll get worse. There will not be a stone left in place. More of the same will not do. More political deals, more economic machinations, nor ma no more major reconstructions and reorganizations and bright ideas and five-point plans. And whatever it is, more of the same. It will only be worse because, because you have not heard from me, you have not listened to me, you are going it alone. In our nation, it doesn't matter who's in politics, if they are not governing us under God's law, it's going to go from bad to worse. And Jesus weeps because God is broken hearted. God is not regretting it. God is broken hearted. And he weeps. That's why he intervenes. He intervenes in a very tangible way as well. You can see this. This is not a parable. Jesus actually arrives, gets the donkey, goes down over the valley, through the gate, into the city, into the middle of the temple, and does the business. It's not sort of an idea. Intervention is real intervention when it comes to God. He doesn't intervene by drone. He doesn't intervene by satellite or by Skype. He actually arrives. So somebody talking about their heart and their heart issues. You can, you can find out an awful lot about a heart, I get it these days, by, um, you know, with scams and those wire things and all that. When it comes to the real crunch, you've got to get in there. So they put a wire in this little thing. It goes all through your veins and works its way on. And finally, this little eye thing on the end of this um, thing arrives in your heart and looks round. God has got that kind of intervention, not some clever scanner where you don't have to touch the person. He arrives in Jerusalem tangibly. As we know, we're on familiar ground here with enormous, enormous authority and power and kingship. He says, we are going. Get the donkey. He gets on. He doesn't complain when everybody showers him with praise. He's quite happy with that because he is the king and he is the Messiah. And for once, even if they're only half right, they are right. And he goes straight into Jerusalem. He doesn't ask anybody. He goes straight into the temple and he speaks about my father's house. God intervenes effectively, not ineffectively. He doesn't just come and flap around and say how sorry he is. And, you know, 
like those politicians when, when, when half of Somerset was flooded, they all turned up and went, oh, how wet it is. Now, it's not intervention. You don't intervene, intervene with Wellington Boots. He, he comes with authority to really intervene. So much so that at the end of the day, he says, I have put the entire resources of heaven behind this intervention. So much so that I put myself behind it. In fact, I'll put myself on this. And in the end, the price is himself. It is that much. And so there's that humility, that vulnerability, which we have at Palm Sunday. That he will give himself. He weeps, he intervenes. And immediately, even on that day, he goes into the temple and, to use a phrase, he begins to save the day. He goes in and he clears space and makes all this at the very heart of everything. The, uh, in the Mark version uh, in the New English Bible reads this. I think this is nice. And he would not allow anyone to use the temple court as a thoroughfare for carrying goods. He makes space for prayer. In other words, he makes space for, for people to meet with God. Amidst all this, the beginning of saving the day is the opportunity to meet with Jesus. Amidst all that economic, social, moral um, malaise, against all the darkness, we need a pot of light. And the spot of light is that you can meet with me. Nobody's walking across this space, he says. I want to pray here. Meet with me here. And out of this space, this holy space, men and women can meet him in the darkness, at the very heart of it, the heart of the temple, at the heart of Jerusalem, the heart of the matter, the heart of the problem. They can meet Jesus. He makes that space. He makes the opportunity and says, at this point, you can meet with me. And as we know with the Easter story, that takes us on. You can meet with me. You can share in the victory of my cross for the forgiveness of sins, for the restoration and healing, and in the power of the resurrection for a new beginning and a new way forward. But even on that day, which is not all of Easter as we know, he begins to save the day. He weeps, he intervenes to save the day. We need to hear that. This is what, whether you are still picking through the wreckage on the, on, on the side of a mountain, whether you are looking at a, um, a candle in some German church with the bells ringing, whether it is you are in a refugee camp or in a cellar, whether you are wishing there had been a food bank here in Penzance, but there isn't because it's the weekend, whatever, he weeps, he comes, and he begins to save the day. Some of you here, in a very undramatic way, will have dark places in your life. Small crises, big crises, things that you're afraid of, things that you worry about. Things that seem very contemporary and nowhere near people in sandals with palm trees. But the message is the same. Wherever your darkness is, he comes, he weeps, he intervenes, and he comes to save the day. He comes to meet you in the darkness and say, this is my space. This is where you can meet me. But as his disciples, he also says, follow me. I, I'm up for Palm Sunday, as long as I could be standing around waving the palm leaves when the donkey goes by. The disciples are stuck with the donkey and they go with him into Jerusalem. <laughs> follow me means follow me, not just wave at me. And so if we are the people of God, it is a time that we did some weeping. Somebody ought to weep, not just the next of kin of the latest disaster. When have we seen a politician weep? The nearest thing is when they lose an election. When do they weep about something real? When do our leaders weep? When do we weep? Well, I don't weep. I'm not a weeper. I'm a man. I don't weep. It's time somebody wept in a fallen nation of darkness when we are far astray and where it will only get worse. Not because I say so, not because I have a political view, but because the word of God says so. It's time somebody wept. 
And it's time that we intervened. How long have we kept our heads down? How long have we wanted to be cuddly in the middle of the community? How, how, how often are we not allowed to say, we're not allowed to say anything political, interestingly. None of the people that want to stand for us in Parliament will say on their literature that whether they're a Christian or not. It's time that we stood out. It's time that we took it to heart like Jesus and wept, and then it's time that we intervene. It's time that you and I, following him, should start saving the day rather than moaning about the day. Go to the heart of the matter. Whether it is we put time and effort into our prayers for people way beyond us, Real prayer, not just mentioning it in a list. Whether it is in the people we meet with their needs, whether they're ill, whether they're lonely, whether they're depressed, whether they're a bit down, but above all, whether they don't know Jesus. Whether we begin to say, I will pray with you. Let me pray with you now. And they say, oh, I don't want to pray with you. I'll pray with you. And you get confrontation. Jesus does confrontation. You don't go into Jerusalem just, to, just like some United Nations observer. We're not doing anything, but we're just here to see. I need to intervene if I'm going to change the day. I need to intervene perhaps in my politics, in my talking, in my conversation. Goodness knows we've got a lot of time for conversation at the moment. Or perhaps it's in, within social justice or the environment or whatever it is. Not just Christians are involved, but Christians are involved with the gospel. This is what the Bible says, what Jesus says. Oh, we don't want to hear about that, but you're going to hear because that's what he says. Perhaps it is that we need to be intervening in people's lives to bring them to a faith in Jesus, to be finally evangelical in our message. Perhaps we need to be prepared for Jesus to so change us by intervening with us that we are empowered to save the day. And so this, this morning, it seems that the palm leaves and the hosanna is absolutely, absolutely where we are. It's absolutely modern in the hurting of our world and the hurting of our hearts. To so come to communion and say, Lord, I just thank you that amidst everything, I would you imagine when I stand here, and if you'd like to come for communion, you can in a moment, to say, Jesus says, don't let anybody walk across this space carrying loads. This is sacred space. I have come, I have intervened because it's a mess and I have come to save the day. When you go back, think, and I will follow him in that. I will follow him in that in this coming week. The band are just going to come and lead us as we come to communion now. I'm going to sing, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. I'm in that place once again. Um, perhaps I'm going to put away my palm leaf and follow Jesus into the temple into the heart of darkness let's stand, shall we quietly and sing this together Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice